Hope Diamond The Hope Diamond is a 45.52 carat 9.104 G diamond originally extracted in the 17th century from the collar mine in Gonshur, India. It is blue in color due to trace amounts of boron. Its exceptional size has revealed new information about the formation of diamonds. The stone is known as one of the Golconda diamonds. The earliest records of the diamond show that French gem merchant Jean-Baptiste Tavernier purchased it in 1666 as the Tavernier Blue. The stone was cut and renamed the French Blue Le Bleu de France. Tavernier sold the stone to King Louis Roman XIV of France in 1668. It was stolen in 1792 and recut, with the largest section of the diamond appearing under the Hope name in an 1839 gem catalogue from the Hope banking family. The diamond has had several owners, including Washington socialite Evalyn Walsh McLean, who was often seen wearing it. New York gem merchant Harry Winston purchased the diamond in 1949, touring it for several years before donating it in 1958 to the National Museum of Natural History in the United States, where it is on permanent exhibition. People typically think of the Hope Diamond as a historic gem, but it's important as a rare scientific specimen that can provide vital insights into our knowledge of diamonds and how they are formed in the earth. Classification The Hope Diamond, also known as Le Bijou du Roy the King's Jewel, Le Bleu de France the French Blue, and the Tavernier Blue is a large 45.52 carat 9.104 G, W Deep Blue Diamond, studded in a pendant toys in Dior, it is currently housed in the National Gem and Mineral Collection at the National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. It is blue under ordinary light because of trace amounts of boron within its crystal structure and exhibits a red phosphorescence under exposure to ultraviolet light. It is classified as a type E of diamond. The Hope Diamond has changed hands numerous times on its way from Hyderabad to India, France, Great Britain, and the United States, where it is on public display. It has been described as the most famous diamond in the world. Physical Properties Weight In December 1988, the Gemological Institute of America's laboratory determined the diamond to weigh 45.52 carats 9.104 g, 0.3211 oz. Size and Shape the diamond has been compared in size and shape to a pigeon egg or a walnut that is pear-shaped. The length, width, and depth are 25.60 mm x 21.78 mm x 12.0 mm 1 in x 7 slash 8 in x 15 slash 32 in. Color, it has been described as being a fancy dark grayish blue as well as dark blue in color or having a steely blue color. Blue diamonds, similar to the Hope, can be shown by colorimetric measurements to be greater lower in saturation than blue sapphires. In 1996, the Gemological Institute of America examined the diamond and, using their proprietary scale, graded it fancy deep grayish blue. Visually, the gray modifier mask is so dark indigo that it produces an inky effect, appearing almost blackish blue in incandescent light. Current photographs of the Hope Diamond use high-intensity light sources that tend to maximize the brilliance of gemstones. In popular literature, many superlatives have been used to describe the Hope Diamond as a superfine deep blue, often comparing it to the color of a fine sapphire, for example, blue of the most beautiful blue sapphire dual of fate, and describing its color as a sapphire blue. Tavernier described it as a beautiful violet. Phosphorescence the stone exhibits an unusually intense, brilliant red phosphorescence after exposure to shortwave ultraviolet light. This glow in the dark effect persists for some time after the light source has been switched off, and this strange quality may have helped fuel its reputation of being cursed. The red glow is a phenomenon of blue diamonds that helps scientists fingerprint them, allowing them to distinguish real ones from artificial ones. The red glow occurs because of a mix of boron and nitrogen in the stone. Clarity. 
the clarity was determined to be the sown with whitish graining present cut the cut was described as being cushion antique brilliant with a faceted girdle and extra facets on the pavilion chemical composition in twenty ten the diamond was removed from its setting to measure its chemical composition after boring a hole one nanometer deep preliminary experiments detected the presence of boron hydrogen and possibly nitrogen the boron concentration varies from zero to eight parts per million the boron is responsible for causing the blue color of the stone touch and feel when associated press reporter ron edmonds was allowed by smithsonian officials to hold the gem in his hands in two thousand three he wrote that the first thought that had come into his mind was wow it was described as cool to the touch he wrote you cradle the forty five point five carat stone about the size of a walnut and heavier than its translucence makes it appear turning it from side to side as the light flashes from its facets knowing it's the hardest natural material yet fearful of dropping it hardness diamonds in general including the hope diamond are the hardest natural minerals known on earth but because of weak planes in the bonds of a diamond's crystalline structure the crystal can fracture along these planes if not handled correctly these weak planes allow diamond cutters to split a rough uncut stone into smaller flawless parts before the process of faceting the stone takes place only a diamond can scratch another diamond so to create a faceted diamond these facets are ground and polished using ever finer grades slash grits of diamond powder history geological beginnings the hope diamond was formed deep within the earth approximately 1.1 billion years ago like all diamonds it was formed when carbon atoms formed strong bonds with each other the hope diamond was originally embedded in kimberlite and was later extracted and refined to form the current gem the hope diamond contains trace amounts of boron atoms intermixed with the carbon structure which results in the rare blue color of the diamond india several accounts based on remarks written by french gem merchant jean baptiste tavernier who obtained the gem in india in sixteen sixty six suggest that the gemstone originated in india in the collar mine in the guncher district of andhra pradesh which at the time was part of the Golconda Kingdom in the 17th century. Several facets of the gemstone's history are unclear, including its original location, condition, finder, and owners. The earliest historical records suggest Tavernier obtained the stone in 1666, possibly through theft. Tavernier brought to Paris a large, uncut stone, the first known precursor to the Hope Diamond. This large stone became known as the Tavernier Blue. It was a crudely cut, triangular stone of 115 carats, 23.0 g. Another estimated weight was 112.23 carats, 22.446 g. Before it, in a newly published historical novel, the French blue gemologist and historian Richard W. Wise proposes that the patent of nobility granted to Tavernier by Louis Roman XIV was part of the payment for the Tavernier blue. According to the theory Jean Baptiste Colbert, the king's finance minister at the time regularly sold noble offices and titles for cash, an outright patent of nobility, according to Wise, was worth approximately 500,000 livres. That amount, plus the reported sale to the king, would have totaled about 720,000 livres, half the price of Tavernier's initial estimate for the gem. There has been controversy regarding the actual weight of the stone. Morrill believed that the 1123-16 carats stated in Tavernier's invoice would be in old French carats, thus 115.28 metric carats. France In 1678, Louis Roman XIV commissioned the court jeweler Jean Pitau to recut the Tavernier blue resulting in a 67.125 carat 13.4 thousand 250 g stone which royal inventories thereafter listed as the blue diamond of the crown of France French diamond bleu de la Couronne de France later English speaking historians have simply called it the French blue the king had the stone set on a cravat pin according to one report Louis ordered Pitau to make him a piece to remember, and Pitau worked for two years, 
resulting in a triangular-shaped 69-carat gem the size of a pigeon's egg that took the breath away as it snared the light, reflecting it back in bluish-gray rays. It was set in gold and was supported by a ribbon for the neck which was worn by the king during ceremonies. At the diamond's dazzling heart was a sun with seven facets, the sun being Louis emblem and seven being a number rich in meaning in biblical cosmology, indicating divinity and spirituality. In 1749, Louis Roman XIV's great-grandson, Louis Roman XV, had the French blue set into a more elaborate jeweled pendant for the Order of the Golden Fleece by court jeweler André Jacquemin. The assembled piece included a red spinel of 107 carats shaped as a dragon breathing covetous flames, as well as 83 red painted diamonds and 112 yellow painted diamonds to suggest a fleece shape. The piece fell into disuse after the death of Louis Roman XV. The diamond became the property of his grandson Louis Roman XVI, whose wife Queen Marie Antoinette used many of the French crown jewels for personal adornment by having the individual gems placed in new settings and combinations, but the French blue remained in this pendant except for a brief time in 1787. Theft and Disappearance on September 11, 1792, while Louis Roman XVI and his family were imprisoned in the Square du Temple during the early stages of the French Revolution's reign of terror, a group of thieves broke into the royal storehouse, the Hotel du Garde Mubel de la Caron, now Hotel de la Marine, stealing most of the crown jewels in a five day looting spree. While many jewels were later recovered, including other pieces of the Order of the Golden Fleece, the French blue was not among them, and it disappeared from history. On January 21, 1793, Louis Roman XVI was guillotined, Marie Antoinette was guillotined on October 16 of the same year. These beheadings are commonly cited as a result of the diamonds curse, but the historical record suggests that Marie Antoinette had never worn the golden fleece pendant because it had been reserved for the exclusive use of the king. A likely scenario is that the French blue, sometimes also known as the blue diamond, was swiftly smuggled to London after being seized in 1792 in Paris. But the exact rock known as the French blue was never seen again, since it almost certainly was recut during this decade's long period of anonymity, with the largest remaining piece becoming the Hope Diamond. One report suggested that the cut was a butchered job because it sheared off 23.5 carats from the larger rock as well as hurting its extraordinary luster. It was long believed that the Hope Diamond was cut from the French blue, but confirmation came when a three-dimensional leaden model of the latter was rediscovered in the archives of the Paris National Museum of Natural History in 2000. Previously, the dimensions of the French blue had been known only from two drawings made in 1749 and 1789, although the model differs slightly from the drawings in some details. These details are identical to features of the Hope Diamond, allowing CAD technology. The leaden model revealed 20 unknown facets on the back of the French blue. It also confirmed the diamond underwent a rather rough recut that removed the three points and reduced the thickness by a few millimeters. The Sun King's blue diamond became unrecognizable, and the barrack style of the original cut was definitely lost. Historians suggested that one burglar, Cadet Galat, took several jewels, including the French blue in the Côte de Bretigny spinel, to Le Havre and then to London where the French blue was cut in two pieces. Morrill adds that in 1796, Pilot attempted to resell the Côte de Bretagne in France, but was forced to relinquish it to fellow thief Lancry de la Loyal, who put Pilot into debtor's prison. In a contrasting report, historian Richard Curin speculated that the theft of the French crown jewels was in fact engineered by the revolutionary leader Georges Danton, as part of a plan to bribe an opposing military commander, Duke Carl Wilhelm of Brunswick. When under attack by Napoleon in 1805, Carl Wilhelm may have had the French blue recut to disguise its identity in this form. The stone could have come to Great Britain in 1806, when his family fled there to join his daughter Caroline of Brunswick.
Although Caroline was the wife of the Prince Regent George, later George IV of the United Kingdom, she lived apart from her husband, and financial straits sometimes forced her to quietly sell her own jewels to support her household. Caroline's nephew, Duke Carl Friedrich, was later known to possess a 13.75 carat, 2.750 g blue diamond, which was widely thought to be another piece of the French blue. This smaller diamond's present whereabouts are unknown, and the recent CAD reconstruction of the French blue fits too tightly around the Hope Diamond. United Kingdom A blue diamond with the same shape, size, and color as the Hope Diamond was recorded by John Franzelin as in the possession of the London Diamond, merchant Daniel Eliasson in September 1812. The jewel was a massive blue stone of 45.54 carats and weighed 177 grains, 4 grains equals 1 carat. The 1812 date was just days after 20 years since the theft of the French blue, just as the statute of limitations for the crime had taken effect. While the diamond had disappeared for two decades, there were questions whether this diamond, now in Great Britain, was exactly the same one as had belonged to the French kings. Scientific investigation in 2008 confirmed beyond reasonable doubt that the Hope Diamond and that owned by the kings of France were indeed the same gemstone. There are conflicting reports about what happened to the diamond during these years. Eliasson's diamond may have been acquired by George IV, a source at the Smithsonian suggested. There were several references suggesting that George had indeed owned the diamond. After his death in 1830, it has been alleged that some of this mixed collection was stolen by George's last mistress, Elizabeth Kinningham, and some of his personal effects were discreetly liquidated to cover the many debts he had left behind him. Another report states that the king's debts were so enormous that the diamond was probably sold through private channels. In either case, the blue diamond was not retained by the British royal family. The stone was later reported to have been acquired by a rich London banker named Thomas Hope for either $65,000 or $90,000. It has been suggested that Eliasson may have been a front for Hope, acting not as a diamond merchant venturing money on his own account, but rather as an agent to acquire the diamond for the banker. In 1839, the Hope Diamond appeared in a published catalogue of the gem collection of Henry Philip Hope, who was a member of the same Anglo-Dutch banking family. The stone was set in a fairly simple medallion surrounded by many smaller white diamonds, which he sometimes lent to Louisa de Lapour Bresford, the widow of his brother, Thomas Hope, for society balls. After falling into the ownership of the Hope family, the stone came to be known as the Hope Diamond. Henry Philip Hope died in 1839, the same year as the publication of his collection catalogue. His three nephews, the sons of Thomas and Louisa, fought in court for ten years over his inheritance, and ultimately the collection was split up. The oldest nephew, Henry Thomas Hope, received eight of the most valuable gems, including the Hope Diamond. It was displayed in the Great Exhibition of London in 1851 and at the 1855 Exposition Universelle in Paris, but was usually kept in a bank vault. In 1861, Henry Thomas, Hope's only child, Henrietta, married Henry Pelham Clinton and later Duke of Newcastle. When Hope died on December 4, 1862, his wife Anna Dell inherited the gem, but she feared that the profligate lifestyle of her son-in-law might cause him to sell the Hope properties. Upon Adele's death in 1884, the entire Hope estate, including the Hope Diamond, was entrusted to Henrietta's younger son, Henry Francis Pelham Clinton, on the condition that he add the name of Hope to his own surnames when he reached the age of legal majority. As Lord Francis Hope, this grandson received his legacy in 1887. However, he had only a life interest in his inheritance, meaning that he could not sell any part of it without court permission. In 1894, Lord Francis Hope met the American concert hall singer Mayo, who has been described as the sensation of two continents, and they were married the same year, one account suggests, that Yo wore the Hope diamond on at least one occasion. 
She later claimed that she had worn it at social gatherings and had an exact replica made for her performances, but her husband claimed otherwise. Lord Francis lived beyond his means, and this eventually caught up with him, leading to marriage troubles and financial reverses, and he found that he had to sell the diamond. In 1896, his bankruptcy was discharged, but as he could not sell the Hope Diamond without the court's permission, he was supported financially by his wife during these intervening years. In 1901, the financial situation had changed, and after a long legal fight, he was given permission to sell the Hope Diamond by an order of the Master in Chancery, but Mayot ran off with a gentleman friend named Putnam Strong, who was a son of the former New York City Mayor William L. Strong. Francis Hope and Mayo were divorced in 1902. Francis sold the diamond for £29,000 of today to Adolf Whale, a London jewel merchant. Whale later sold the stone to the diamond dealer Simon Frankel, based in New York, and Slash or London, who took it to New York. One report stated that he had paid $250,000 million today. However, in New York it was evaluated to be worth $141,032.4.59 million today. United States 1902 present. Accounts vary about what happened to the diamond during the years 1902-1907. One account suggested that it lay in the William and Theodore safe during these years while the jewelers took it out periodically to show it to wealthy Americans, a rival account probably invented to help add mystery to the Hope Diamond story. There were reports in one story in the New York Times of several owners of the gem, perhaps who had bought it from Frankel and owned it temporarily, who met with ill fortune. But this report conflicts with the more likely possibility that the gem remained in the hands of the Frankel jewelry firm during these years. Like many jewelry firms, the Frankel business ran into financial difficulties during the Depression of 1907 and referred to the gem as the Hudu Diamond. In 1908, Frankel sold the diamond for $400,000, $12.06 million today. A contrary report, however, suggested that Sultan Abdul Hamid Deed owned the gem but ordered Habib to sell it when his throne began to totter. Habib reportedly sold the stone in Paris in 1909, for $80,000, $2.41 million today. The Parisian jewel merchant Simon Rose now bought the Hope Diamond for 400,000 francs and resold it in 1910 to Pierre Cartier for 550,000 francs. In 1910, it was offered for $150,000, $4.36 million today, according to one report. Pierre Cartier tried to sell the Hope Diamond to Washington, D.C., socialite Evalyn Walsh McLean and her husband in 1910. Cartier was a consummate salesman who used an understated presentation to entice Mrs. McLean. He described the gem's illustrious history to her while keeping it concealed underneath special wrapping paper. The suspense worked. McLean became impatient to the point where she suddenly requested to see the stone. She recalled later that Cartier held before our eyes the Hope Diamond. Nevertheless, she initially rejected the offer. Cartier had it reset. She found the stone much more appealing in this new modern style. There were conflicting reports about the sale in the New York Times. One account suggested that the young McLean couple had agreed to purchase the diamond, but after having learned about its unfortunate supposed history, the couple had wanted to back out of the deal since they knew nothing of the history of misfortunes that have beset its various owners. Both Ned McLean and his pretty wife are quite young and in a way unsophisticated, although they were born and reared in an atmosphere of wealth and luxury. All their lives they have known more of jewelry, finery, banquets, automobiles, horses, and other articles of pleasure. The brow ha ha over the diamonds supposed the luck prompted a worried editor of the jeweler's circular weekly to write, No mention of any ill luck having befallen Eliasson, Hope, or any of their descendants was ever made. The Frankels surely were very prosperous while the stone was in their possession, as were the dealers who held it in Europe. 
Habib's misfortune referred to in the newspaper accounts occurred long after he had sold the stone. As Francis Hope never had the stone, and Mayo probably never saw it, then the newspaper accounts at the time mentioned were laughed at, but since then it has been the custom not only to revive these stories every time mention of the stone appears in the public press, but to add to them fictitious incidents of misfortune as to alleged possessors of the stone at various times. A tenuous deal involved wrangling among attorneys for both Cartier and the McLeans, but finally in 1911 the couple bought the gem for over $300,000, over $8.07 million today, although there are differing estimates of the sales price at $150,000 and $180,000. An alternative scenario is that the McLeans may have fabricated concern about the supposed curse to generate publicity to increase the value of their investment. A description was that the gemstone lay on a bed of white silk and surrounded by many small white diamonds cut pear-shaped. The new setting was the current platinum framework surrounded by a row of 16 diamonds which alternated between old mine cut and pear-shaped variants. Mrs. McLean wore it to a brilliant reception in February 1912 when it was reported that it was the first time it had been worn in public since it had changed owners. She would sport the diamond at social events and wore it to numerous social occasions that she had organized. The Hope Diamond in its original pendant must have looked fantastic at parties circa the 1920s when it hung around the neck of owner of Alan Walsh McLean's Great Dane, Mike. There were reports that she misplaced it at parties deliberately and frequently, and then make a children's game out of finding the hope, and times when she hid the diamond somewhere on her estate during the lavish parties she threw and invite guests to find it. The stone prompted elaborate security precautions. William Schindel, a former Secret Service man, has been engaged to guard the stone. He in turn will be guarded by Leo Costello and Simon Blake private detectives. The stone will be kept at the McLean mansion during the day and each night will be deposited in a safe deposit vault. When Mrs. McLean wears the gem at balls and receptions arrangements have been made to keep the safe deposit building open until after the function that the stone may be safely stored away. A special automobile has been purchased to convey the guards to and from the house to the trust company's building. But the stone was not stolen during their ownership. When Mrs. McLean died in 1947, she bequeathed the diamond to her grandchildren through a will which insisted that her former property would remain in the custody of trustees until the eldest child had reached 25 years of age. This requirement would have prevented any sale for the next two decades. However, the trustees gained permission to sell her jewels to settle her debts and in 1949 sold them to New York diamond merchant Harry Winston. He purchased McLean's entire jewelry collection. Over the next decade, Winston exhibited McLean's necklace in his court of jewels, a tour of jewels around the United States, as well as various promotional events and charity balls. The diamond appeared on the television quiz show The Names the Same, in an episode which first aired on August 16, 1955 when a teenaged contestant with the actual name Hope Diamond was one of the mystery guests, as well as at the August 1958 Canadian National Exhibition. At some point, Winston also had the Hope Diamond's bottom facet slightly recut to increase its brilliance. Smithsonian Ownership Smithsonian mineralogist George Switzer is credited with persuading jeweler Harry Winston to donate the Hope Diamond for a proposed National Gem collection to be housed at the National Museum of Natural History. On November 10, 1958, Winston acquiesced, sending it through U.S. mail in a box wrapped in brown paper as simple registered mail insured for $1 million at a cost of $145.29 of which $2.44 was for postage and the balance insurance. Upon its arrival, it became specimen hash 217,868. Winston had never believed in any of the tales about the curse. He donated the diamond with the hope that it would help the United States establish a gem collection. Winston died many years later, in 1978, of a heart attack. 
Winston's gift, according to Smithsonian curator Dr. Jeffrey Post, indeed helped spur additional gifts to the museum. For its first four decades in the National Museum of Natural History, the Hope Diamond lay in its necklace inside a glass-fronted safe as part of the Gems and Jewelry Gallery, except for a few brief excursions, a 1962 exhibition to the Louvre, the 1965 Rand Easter Show in Johannesburg, South Africa, and two visits back to guard against theft, during the Diamond's trip to the 1962 Louvre exhibition, Switzer traveled to Paris with the Hope Diamond tucked inside a velvet pouch, sewn by his wife. The Hope Diamond was placed into the pouch, which was pinned inside Switzer's pants pocket for the flight. When the Smithsonian's gallery was renovated in 1997, the necklace was moved onto a rotating pedestal inside a cylinder made of 3-inch 76mm thick bulletproof glass in its own display room adjacent to the main exhibit of the National Gem Collection in the Janet Annenberg Hooker Hall of Geology, Gems, and Minerals. The Hope Diamond is the most popular jewel on display and the collection's centerpiece. In 1988, specialists with the Gemological Institute of America graded it and noticed evidence of wear and its remarkably strong phosphorescence, with its clarity slightly affected by a whitish graining, which is common to blue diamonds. A highly sensitive colorimeter found tiny traces of a very slight violet component, which is imperceptible to normal vision. In 2005, the Smithsonian published a year-long computer-aided geometry research which officially acknowledged that the Hope Diamond is, in fact, cut from the stolen French blue crown jewel. In 2009, the Smithsonian announced a temporary new setting for the jewel to celebrate a half-century at the National Museum of Natural History. Starting in September 2009, the 45.52-carat-9.104-G diamond was exhibited as a stand-alone gem with no setting. It had been removed from its setting for cleaning from time to time, but this was the first time it would be on public display by itself. Previously, it had been shown in a platinum setting, surrounded by 16 white pear-shaped and cushion-cut diamonds, suspended from a chain containing 45 diamonds. The Hope returned to its traditional setting in late 2010. On November 18, 2010, the Hope Diamond was unveiled and displayed at the Smithsonian in a temporary newly designed necklace called Embracing Hope, created by the Harry Winston firm. Three designs for the new setting, all white diamonds and white metal, were created and the public voted on the final version. The Hope Diamond also is resting on a new dark blue neck form, which the Harry Winston firm commissioned from display organization, Pack Team Group. Previously, the Hope Diamond had been displayed as a loose gem since late summer of 2009. A Smithsonian curator described it as priceless because it was irreplaceable, although it was reported to be insured for $250 million. On January 13, 2012, the diamond was returned to its historic setting, and the current necklace was implanted with another diamond worth at least a million dollars. The necklace with the new diamond will be sold to benefit the Smithsonian. Changes over time. Curse mythology. Superstitions, publicity, marketing. The diamond has been surrounded by a mythology of a reputed curse to the effect that it brings misfortune and tragedy to persons who own it or wear it, but there are strong indications that such stories were fabricated to enhance the stone's mystery and appeal since increased publicity usually raised the gem's value and newsworthiness. According to specious accounts in the late 19th and early 20th century, the original form of the Hope Diamond was stolen from an eye of a sculpted statue of the goddess Sita, the wife of Rama, the seventh avatar of Vishnu. However, much like the curse of Tutankhamun, this general type of legend was most likely the invention of Western authors during the Victorian era, and the specific legends about the Hope Diamond's cursed origin were invented in the early 20th century to add mystique to the stone and increase its sales appeal, as well as increase newspaper sales. It fueled speculation that humans possessing the gemstone were fated 
to have bad luck with varying reports of undetermined veracity. A report in 2006 in the New York Times, however, suggested that any hard evidence linking it to tragedy has yet to be officially proven. There is evidence of several newspaper accounts which helped spread the cursed story. A New Zealand newspaper article in 1888 described the supposedly lurid history of the Hope Diamond, including a claim that it was said once to have formed the single Eye of a Great Idol, as part of a confused description that also claimed that its namesake owner had personally brought it from India, and that the diamond's true color was white, although when held to the light. An additional account of the Hope Diamond's cursed origins was a fanciful and anonymously written newspaper article in 1909. It was followed by another New York Times article in 1911, which gave a list of supposed cases of ill fortune, but with few confirmations from other sources. Jack Collett bought the Hope Diamond from Simon Frankel and died by suicide. Prince Ivan Kanatovsky bought it from Collett, but was killed by Russian revolutionists. Kanatovsky loaned it to M. Ladu, who was murdered by her sweetheart. Simon Mencharides, who had once sold it to the Turkish Sultan, was thrown from a precipice along with his wife and young child. Sultan Hamid gave it to Abu Sabir to polish, but later Sabir was imprisoned and tortured. Stone guardian Kulab Bey was hanged by a mob in Turkey. A Turkish attendant named Haver Agha was hanged for having it in his possession. Tavernier, who brought the stone from India to Paris, was torn to pieces by wild dogs in Constantinople. King Louis gave it to Madame de Montespan, whom later he abandoned. Nicolas Fauquet, an intendant of France, borrowed it temporarily to wear it, but was disgraced and died in prison. A temporary wearer, Princess de Lambelle, was torn to pieces by a French mob. Jeweler William Fowles, who recut the stone, died a ruined man. William Fowles' son Hendrick stole the jewel from his father and later died by suicide. Some years after Hendrick, it was sold to Francis Dolieu, who died in misery and want. The mainstream view is that these accounts are specious and speculative since there are few, if any, independent confirmations to back them up. A few months later, perhaps compounded by inaccurate reports in the New York Times on November 17, 1909, it was incorrectly reported that the diamond's former owner, Selim Habib, had drowned in a shipwreck of the steamer Seine near Singapore. In fact, it was a different person with the same name, not the owner of the diamond. There was speculation that jeweler Pierre Cartier further embroidered the lurid tales to intrigue Valen Walsh McLean into buying the Hope Diamond, in 1911. The theme of greedy robbers stealing a valuable object from the tomb or shrine of an ancient god or ruler, and then being punished by it, is one which repeats in many different forms of literature. A likely source of inspiration for the fabrications was the Wilkie Collins 1868 novel, The Moonstone, which created a coherent narrative from vague and largely disregarded legends, which had been attached to other diamonds, such as the Koh Noor and the Orloff Diamond. The theme can be seen in films such as The Mummy as well as stories about the curse of Egyptian King Tutankhamun and in more recent films such as the Indiana Jones films. In keeping with these scripts, according to the legend, Tavernier did not buy the Hope Diamond but stole it from a Hindu temple where it had been set as one of two matching eyes of an idol, and the temple priests then laid a curse on whoever might possess the missing stone. Largely because the other blue diamond I never surfaced, historians dismissed the fantastical story. The stories generally do not bear up to more pointed examination. For example, the legend that Tavernier's body was torn apart by wolves is inconsistent with historical evidence which shows that he lived to 84 and died of natural causes. It is possible that the overblown story of the curse, possibly fueled by Cartier and others, may have caused some hesitation on the part of the prospective buyers, the McLeans, around 1911. When a lawsuit between buyer and seller erupted about the terms of the deal, newspapers kept alive reports of the diamond's malevolent influence with reports like this one, which blamed the stone's curse on having caused, of all things, the lawsuit itself. 
the malevolent influence that has for centuries dogged with discord and disaster the owners of the famous Hope Diamond has started again, and without waste of time, despite special precautions against ill luck taken at the time of its last sale, according to John S. Wise, Jr., of 20 Broad Street, attorney for Cartiers, the Fifth Avenue jewelers, who are sued. The Hope Diamond was also blamed for the unhappy fates of other historical figures vaguely linked to its ownership, such as the falls of Madame Athenais de Montespan and French finance minister Nicolas Fauque during the reign of Louis Roman XIV of France, the beheadings of Louis Roman XVI and Marie Antoinette, and the rape and mutilation of the Princess de Lambole. Even jewelers who may have handled the Hope Diamond were not spared from its reputed malice the insanity and suicide of Jacques Collot, who supposedly bought it from Eliasson, and the financial ruin of the jeweler Simon Frankel, who bought it from the Hope family, were linked to the stone. But although he is documented as a French diamond dealer of the correct era, Collot has no recorded connection with the stone, and Frankel's misfortunes were in the midst of economic straits that also ruined many of his peers. The legend includes deaths of numerous other characters who had been previously unknown. Diamond cutter Wilhelm Fowles, killed by his son Hendrik, who stole it and later committed suicide, Francois Beaulieu, who received the stone from Hendrik but starved to death after selling it to Iliasson, a Russian prince named Kanatowski, who lent it to French actress Laura. However, the existence of only a few of these characters has been verified historically, the actress May Yo made repeated attempts to capitalize on her identity as the former wife of the last hope to own the diamond, and sometimes blamed the gemstone for her misfortunes. In July 1902, months after Lord Francis divorced her, she told police in Australia that her lover, Putnam Strong, had abandoned her and taken her jewels. In fact, the couple reconciled, married later that year, but divorced in 1910. On her third marriage in 1920, she persuaded film producer George Klein to back a 15-episode serial The Hope Diamond Mystery, which added fictitious characters to the tale, but the project was not successful. In 1921, she hired Henry Layford Gates to help her write The Mystery of the Hope Diamond, in which she starred as Lady Frances Hope. The film added more characters, including a fictionalized tavernier, and added merit among the diamond's victims. She also wore her copy of the Hope, trying to generate more publicity to further her career. Evalyn Walsh McLean added her own narrative to the story behind the Blue Jewel, including that one of the owners had been Catherine the Great, although there are no confirmations that the Russian ruler ever owned the diamond. McLean would bring the diamond out for friends to try on, including Warren G. Harding and Florence Harding. Since the Smithsonian acquired the gemstone, the curse appears to have gone dormant. Owning the diamond has brought nothing but good luck for the nonprofit National Museum, according to a Smithsonian curator, and has helped it build a world-class gem collection with rising attendance levels. Owners and their fates, their fates. Replicas. In 2007, a lead cast of the French Blue Diamond was discovered in the gemological collections of the National Museum of Natural History in Paris. This triggered an investigation by an international team of researchers into the stone's history, which previously had to rely on two-dimensional sketches of the diamond. The three-dimensional structure allowed researchers to apply techniques such as computer-aided drawing analysis. The methods for digitally reconstructing the gem are reviewed in this article's theft and disappearance section. The emblem of the Golden Fleece of Louis Roman XV was reconstructed around the French blue, including the Cote de Bretigny spinel of 107 carats 21.4 g, the Basu diamond of 32.62 carats 6.524 g, three oriental topazes yellow sapphires, five brilliance of up to five carats. As part of the investigation, the Tavernier Blue Diamond was reconstructed from the original French edition of Tavernier's Voyages rather than the later London edition, which had distorted and modified Tavernier's original figures. The Smithsonian Institution provided ray tracing 
and optical spectroscopic data about the Hope Diamond. The lead cast had been catalogued at the French Museum in 1850 and was provided by a prominent Parisian jeweler named Charles Archard, who lived during the same generation as René Just Hoy, who died in 1822. Most likely, the lead cast was made near 1815, because that was the year that similar entries from the 1850 catalog had been made. The model was accompanied by a label stating that the French blue was in the possession of a person known as Mr. Hope of London. Other archives at the museum suggests that Hope was a customer of a chart for many years, particularly for blue gems. These findings have helped investigators piece together what may have happened during the Rock's anonymous years during the several decades following 1792. According to one line of reasoning, the first Hope to have the Hope Diamond Henry Philip Hope might have possessed the French blue that he had acquired some time after the 1792 robbery in Paris, perhaps around 1794 minus 1795, when the Hopes were believed to have left Holland for London to escape Napoleon's armies. At about the same time, Cadet Galat, who may have been one of the thieves to have stolen the Golden Fleece, arrived in London. This places Mr. Hope and Mr. Gillot in London at the same time. According to a late 19th century historian named Bax, a contract was made between Cadet Gillot and a French aristocrat named Lancry de Laloyal in 1796 to sell the 107 carat 21.4 G spinel dragon of the Golden Fleece. According to this line of reasoning, in 1802 Hope sold his assets and the Continental blockade by Napoleon led the Hopes Bank into a serious financial crisis by 1808, and the crisis peaked during the winter of 1811-1812. This put Mr. Hope in a financial bind. There is a possibility that, given his financial predicament, Hope pawned the French blue to jewel merchant Iliasson to get much-needed cash when the British currency, sterling, was highly depreciated. This is consistent with the entry in Eliasson's records about having the stone in 1812. However, the diamond's owners may have felt pressure to recut the stone quickly to disguise its identity, since if the French government had learned of its existence, it may have sued the owners for repossession. Regardless of whether Mr. Hope had lost possession or kept it during these years, by 1824 it was again in his possession. It was around this time that Iliasson died, Hope's financial situation has been restored thanks to efforts by the Barings, who saved the Hope Bank in the difficult financial years of 1812-1820. Accordingly, if this is correct, then the lead cast of the French Blue and the Hope Diamond are likely to have been created in the same workshop, possibly in London, and probably a little before 1812. The lead cast had important ramifications since it gave enough information to curators at the French Museum to commission the first exact replicas of both the tavernier and French blue diamonds using a material which simulate, with the help of artisans who work with gems known as lapidaries, led by Scott Sutcher. These replicas have been completed and displayed with the French crown jewels and the great sapphire of Louis Roman XIV, a mock hole cut sapphire of 135.7 carats 27.14 g. Artisans recreated the elaborate parure of different colored gems known as the Golden Fleece of King Louis Roman XV of France, which is arguably the most fabulous work in the history of French jewelry. This happened from 2007 2010. The original parure created in 1749 by royal jeweler Pierre Andre Jacquemin was stolen and broken in 1792. The reassembled jewel contained the French blue and the Bazou diamonds as well as the Cote de Bretagne spinel and hundreds of smaller diamonds. Three years of work were needed to recreate this jewel and it required exacting and precise skill which revealed not only the skill of today's lapidaries but the skill of its original 18th century designers. The reconstructed jewel was presented by Herbert Horowitz with Frank Wafarges of the French Museum in attendance at the former Royal Storehouse in Paris on June 30, 2010, which was the same site where the original had been stolen 218 years before. Additional recreations were made possible by new discoveries. 
a previously unknown drawing of the Golden Fleece was rediscovered in Switzerland in the 1980s, and two blue diamonds that had ornamented the jewel were found as well, and these recent findings enabled artisans to recreate a copy of the emblem. It led to the construction, using cubic zirconia, of a piece that almost exactly resembles the mythic French blue 69, carats 13.8 G masterpiece. The emblem has another great blue diamond, which was later named the Bazu in reference to a dealer who reportedly had sold it to Louis Roman XIV in 1669. This Bazu diamond was recut in 1749 as a baroque cushion weighing 32.62 carats 6.524 G. The 1791 inventory mentioned that the Bazu was light sky blue, which is consistent with the fact that the golden fleece of the color adornment was made of a variety of great colored gems. Based on documents kept in a private collection, it could be shown that this particular diamond was not hexagonal shaped, as some historians had previously thought, but was in a shape best described as rounded squared, similar to the so-called Regent Diamond. There is a report that a curator from the French Museum will assert that the hexagonal cut from the bazu is inconsistent historically and gemologically. The bazu stone referred to another version of Louis Roman XV's Great Golden Fleece, made out of blue sapphires instead of blue diamonds. According to one view, this version appears to have never been manufactured, but only suggested to the king as an alternative to the effective final version, bearing two blue diamonds. Nevertheless, replicas of both blue diamonds were cut by Scott Sutcher using cubic zirconia, one being colored deep blue and the other light blue. The emblem had a third great gem known as the Cote de Bretagne dragon. Its replica was based on a wax likeness sculpted by Pascal Mani, who had based his recreation from three-dimensional scaled pictures of the original object, which had been made by French artist Francois Farges, Farges in turn, had seen the original objects displayed at the Louvre's Gallery de Pollen. In addition, artist Etienne Lepperlier cast a crystal lead glass duplicate of the wax replica of the carved Cote de Bretagne. Its pigmentation is made out of gold and manganese pigments to simulate as close as possible the original color of the spinel. The 500-plus remaining replicas of diamonds were cut from cubic zirconia using a baroque cushion cut. Colors were used to recall the original artwork, red for the flames and yellow for the fleece, and in keeping with the original work, the materials used were initially colorless but were painted in the same fashion used by the artist Jacquemin when the original golden fleece was completed in 1749. Since the original was most likely made out of gold plated with silver, a choice was made to use a matrix mostly made out of 925 grade silver to keep costs under control without compromising quality. A number of different artists helped with this project. The silver matrix was carved by Jean Minashin of Geneva, who used historical drawings of the delicate three-dimensional elements of the dragon's wings and tail as well as the palms around which the dragon is suspended. Casts were made by Andreas Altman. This will allow even more copies to be made in the future. Amico Bifalsi gilded parts of the matrix to recreate the elegant original gold and silver arrangement of the original. All stones were set according to 18th century techniques. Finally, a luxury box containing the golden fleece was recreated by Frederick Violet using crimson colored Moroccan leather. The box was gilded by Didier Montecat to the arms of Louis Roman XV using the king's original iron stamp made by the Symir house. A dark red cremoisy ribbon, made of crimson satin moire, holds the jewel inside the box. Explanatory Notes